So um, I don't know how many of you have seen this setup at the, uh, the trade shows we've done this year, particularly with Comics West and PitCon, but I'll just go ahead and yeah, do this to annoy slightly. Um, what this is demonstrating, audibly, one of the things, but what this is demonstrating is the Jazz Indie, which is this module on the Jazz stack. It's just, you know, it's one, one Jazz module. Uh, connected to a Sandhouse LED, it's actually voltage controlled. So the intensity of the LED, which is also brought out to this fiber, which you can probably only see if you're sitting right there, but the intensity of this LED is, is controlled through an analog voltage output from the Jazz AC. That light is coming out of the LED, going through the sample holder, uh, and then back into its electric fiber and into the spectrometer, also in the stack. This is a lab application that is communicating directly with the jazz over Ethernet. And it is doing two things. It is first reading out a spectrum and then figuring out what gain would be needed on that LED in order to hit a target level, a target intensity. So it's really doing a feedback loop to try to maintain peak intensity right at that green line. And it maintains that by varying the output voltage to that LED as necessary to keep the intensity constant. So what will happen is as I introduce something in the light path that is going to block some of that light and knock that peak down a little bit, the voltage, which is, by the way, tied to the pitch of the sound here on the laptop, the voltage will be increased to keep that spectral peak right at the same intensity. So as I vary this, you can see that the gain will change, and it'll keep you all awake. And uh, but the, the peak intensity will remain the same. So we are doing a feedback control system based on spectral data with the Indy to, uh, to keep this whole system at a constant level of intensity. Jazz Indy is called the Indy because it is for industrial communications really to allow the jazz to integrate with all sorts of different systems using pretty common signaling. So in particular, we have electrical interfaces. And there are actually two connectors on the back of the Indian. One of them is a 26-pin is a uh, connector, which actually connects to this. So a lot of pins really packed in there. And that has a lot of these electrical interfaces in it. And there is another connector, a little 9-pin connector, that has communication buses, so RS-232 and RS-45. I'll talk about those a bit later. So one of the features of the Indy is it has four analog voltage in and four analog voltage out. Uh, voltage is a pretty universal thing to, uh, to use as an interface. It has its failings, it has its weaknesses, which I'll get to in just a moment, but it is very useful to be able to sample or to be able to generate voltages. Uh, zero to five range is pretty typical. The, uh, the Indy actually has in it, in addition to protection circuitry to make sure if you put in too much voltage or if you hook it up to, you know, backwards or something, you're not going to blow anything up. Uh, what we're able to do is take those inputs uh, from the outside, run it through a network of op amps, and that allows us to sample anywhere from negative five to five volts. Uh, this is on a 16-bit AD, so you get 65,000 plus counts resolution for the number range. For the input side of that, we actually have the four inputs from minus five to five. And there's also a pair of uh, two differential pairs uh, that basically take input two minus input one and input uh, four minus input three and sample them separately. Those are actually, those comparison between those voltages are done in hardware. So those are actually measured minus 10, 10 volts. 16 bits on both sides. So pretty high resolution. The, um, both of these can be calibrated. And it's probably recommended that if somebody gets one of these, they would want to calibrate it for their system to make sure that it's in agreement with all of their other stuff. So they probably have a nice high-end uh, multimeter or something. They're going to want to make sure that all their stuff is calibrated to the same basis. If you were really only interested in the range from minus one to one volt, then you could actually calibrate 
just on the outsides of that range and have really accurate calibration for that band from 1921. That's the um, analog voltage in and out. There are some weaknesses to analog voltage. Uh, basically, it's only really good for very short distances. Voltage is not really a, a good way, again, it's something that is inherent in all electronics, but it's not necessarily the best way to send information to test some of these weaknesses. A much better way to send that information is using analog current. Now, I want to talk about this in a little bit of detail because 4 to 20 milliamp current loops might not seem all that intuitive to begin with, so I want to uh, just try to explain what this is about. So, one nice thing about current, if you start sending current over a wire, it has to go out and it has to come back to the same point, so it's always going to be on the loop. But you're more or less assured that the current is going to be constant at all points along that loop. Another nice thing is that if, uh, if somebody trips over a wire or breaks that connection, then the entire loop will go to zero. The current will stop and you can detect that something has happened. So otherwise, these are nice because uh, unlike uh, the voltage loop, they're quite a robust. You're not going to have things inducing enough current to really cause any kind of a problem. So what you would normally use 4 to 20 current loops for, the, the 4 it basically means that you go from having 4 milliamps of current running through the wire up to 20 milliamps of current. And you can assign whatever significance or meaning you want to those two values. Those could be the set points on a valve, or 4 milliamps could represent the minimum operating temperature that's allowed for a device, and 20 could represent the maximum, and you're trying to measure something that's in the middle. So you can assign, you know, 4 can mean the most of something or the least of something, and 20 can mean the opposite. It doesn't really matter. 4 to 20 is just a way to convey information. It's up to the application to figure out what, that inf what information is going to be conveyed that way. The ND can be a transmitter or receiver. Uh, at the same time. Uh, for any of these loops, you have to have an excitation source. You have to have something that is injecting power into the system so that that current comes from somewhere. And in the end, all the current that's transmitted has to return back to ground at that excitation source. So there's a potential between that source relative to itself. So this excitation source on the jazz is only intended as a current loop source. So it doesn't just give you a general purpose 20 volt power supply. So the Indy has a 4 to 20 milliamp transmitter. So in other words, if you provide this with an excitation source, which would come from the jazz itself, then it can vary the amount of current passing through in order to transmit, in order to put this information on the wire uh, that is at some level between minimum and maximum. The uh, 4 to 20 transmitter can be calibrated, but only at two, at two points, at the, the 4 milliamp minimum and the 20 milliamp maximum. Uh, it turns out that with the receiver, you can calibrate it at anywhere within that range that you want, but the transmitter is a little bit special. Uh, one thing to note about the transmitter is that it is entirely isolated from the rest of the board. So it does not receive power from the rest of the jazz electronics unless uh, you loop something like the excitation back to itself. Uh, this is done somewhat for protection so that current flowing through there can't find a way to ground in the jazz and cause problems that way. The 4 to 20 milliamp receiver is actually, uh, it uses the same 16 bit A to D as we have in the, uh, the voltage in. So, thing is it only uses the range from about 0.4 volts up to 2 volts, which is much less than the 0 0.5 volts that that AED supports. And so instead of getting about 16 bits worth of useful resolution, you get about 14.3. One other thing I want to mention is that the 4 to 20 receiver provides its own path to ground, which means that if the Indy is being used as a, a 4 to 20 milliamp receiver, it needs to be at the very end of the line. Just to make this a little more clear, a couple of examples of the 420 current loop in action. So you have to have some sort of an excitation source that the current is going to flow from. If you're using the jazz as a uh, 4 to 20 transmitter, then this excitation source could also be within the jazz, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, so the current will flow out of there into the 
the transmitter positive voltage side, the Jazz Indy will then regulate the current according to however it's been set. And that can be determined programmatically or through manual control or however. And then the current continues to flow out through the negative voltage side and then back down to the rest of the current loop where you can have one or more receivers that are sensing the current as they pass through and eventually there has to be a path back to ground that is common with the uh, excitation source. So in this way, if you have the Indy out somewhere, it can regulate the voltage at some, or regulate the current at some distance from the excitation source on the receiver and transmit some information in a, a way that is robust to noise with respect to interference and uh, having it disconnect. So similarly, uh, to receive, a typical setup would look like this. You'd have an excitation source within the Indy so you set it 10 or 20 volts. By the way, if you're using the, uh, the 420 transmitter in the Jazz, you want to go with 20 volts because the 10 volt is just not enough for the transmitter we have. There. But anyway, so you have an excitation source. You have current coming out that would go to some sort of a remote sensor. This could be, again, a pressure sensor, temperature, pH, O2, um, some sort of position indicator. And then that regulates the, temp the, the uh, current and the returning current is then sensed in the, the Indy itself, and that provides a path back to ground. So you can use the Indy as a, a transmitter or receiver. It can actually be both, but that's really only useful for diagnostic, not really an application. The Indy also provides eight general purpose input and output. These are digital. So there are eight pins that you can assign individually to be inputs or outputs. And if they are outputs, you can assign them to be logic zero or logic one. These are TTL level, which means zero to five volts, uh, where if you, uh, two and a half volts is kind of where the, they're, uh, anything below two and a half volts is zero, anything above two and a half volts is one. These are buffered, so you can <coughs> simply connect to them, you have a little bit of over voltage, they're protected. And they can source up to 5 milliamps and 5 volts, which is decent. And they can also sync 20 milliamps uh, if you set them to a logic zero. This can be useful, for instance, to drive LEDs. Uh, 20 milliamps is enough to often uh, to drive a, an LED directly if you provide a positive voltage source from somewhere else. And uh, the software for these is set up to be uh, is set up to allow each of the pins to be addressed directly. When you indicate what state you want to put the pins in, you also indicate which one or ones you want to change. So you can just blindly write the new state to the device without having to read it first and detect what happened there. You can just simply say, I want to change these pins and send the command, and uh, just those will change. So it's actually a simpler programming model than we've seen before. So that covers much of what was on the 26-pin connector on the Indy. There's also a 9-pin connector for communications. The, uh, there are two communication buses on there, and the RS-232 and RS-45. These allow a remote host, which could be, for instance, a PC or a uh, PLC, some sort of industrial controller, to communicate with the Jazz, acquire spectra, uh, and otherwise you know, try to try to get information out of it. So the serial command protocol that is implemented at this time for the Jazz is modeled after what we use for the USB 2000 Plus. So if you've ever, probably not, but uh, it's a fairly simple protocol to use. You can, you can actually put it into an ASCII mode, and if you go into like hyper terminal in Windows, you can connect to it and set integration time, set averages, and request a spectrum, and it'll come it back to you in text. And uh, it's actually relatively straightforward to then write a uh, program on a PLC or a PC to talk to it in that protocol and get data. Now, one other thing I do want to mention is that something we released alongside with the Indy is that the, uh, the DPU for the Jazz, there's a connector up here, it's marked GPIO. It's a mini HDMI connector, 19 pins. And we actually have RS-232 available on that connector as well, in addition to four more GPIOs. The biggest difference between the RS-232 on the DPU and what you put out of the Indy is that 
What's on the end is fully buffered and uh, protected, which means that if you hook something up long, you're probably not going to hurt anything unless you really go you know, high voltage. Whereas what's on the DPU is more or less a direct connection to the really sensitive bits. So you can use it, but you need to be careful if you're in a very noisy environment in terms of radio interference because you can often get voltages that kind of accumulate. So if you're in an industrial, if you were in an industrial environment, the Indy is just a safer way to go. So RS-232 is uh, known to most people as just being the, the common PC serial port, which you don't actually see much of anymore. It's laptops and a lot of modern computers, they just skip putting along there because USB is much more common for the PC market. But it's a, it's a pretty tried and true communications protocol. Uh, it's low voltage and you get reasonably good data rates over short distances, so you know, 10 or 15 feet few meters, you can, you can do RS-232 pretty well. And um, on the Indy, this is again, it's isolated. We can go from 300 to 115K baud, uh, seven or eight data bits, one or two stop bits, even on or no parity. And if you're using the Indy itself, instead of the Jazz DPU uh, serial interface, we also have hardware and software flow control. These allow, if you have two devices that are talking to each other over RS-232, the flow control allows the slower of the two to kind of pause the communications for a moment uh, while it catches up. So hardware flow control, it does so by signaling on a couple of pins saying stop, and that's pretty much immediate. And then the software flow control, that actually sends uh, some control characters that say, you know, hey, slow down. And uh, since the isolator on that RS-232 is fairly power intensive, it's got to generate like plus or minus, uh, plus or minus five volts. Uh, it, it does pull some power. So if you're on battery out in the field and you want to save some of that power, you can just turn the RS-232 completely off and uh, save yourself that way. This also has RS-45 coming out of the same adapter. There are, I think it's just two pins. It's a differential plus and minus uh, plus ground, which is shared with the RS-232. Uh, this provides the same lower bound of 300 baud, but the upper bound is actually 8 megabaud. You can go much faster. I'll get to why in just a moment. Uh, you can do software flow control only because RS-45 is not defined hardware flow control. You have the same option for data bits, stop bits, and parity, and you can also disable it. But there is not really a standard for RS-45 in terms of what the connector would look like, so you're pretty much on your own to, to make a connector. But uh, the DB9 is totally ubiquitous and you can find it everywhere. So, RS-45, thus, is going to be useful for much longer cable lengths, up into, you know, like 100 meters, thereabouts. So the actual length that you're going to get, as far as I understand at least, is going to depend on the clock rate. So the, the faster the clock rate, the shorter the wires are going to be. Uh, RS-45 is typically used in industrial environments because it is much more tolerant of noise. So how does one go about controlling the Indy? Well, you have a few options. Uh, generally, as with anything on the Jazz, um, the best way to control it is usually to write a program that runs on the Jazz itself because then everything is fully integrated. Uh, jazz scripting does not yet support Indy. Uh, that's also planned for a later phase. OmniDriver can control the Indy, although if you're using the wrapper interface and all that you've got right now is USB, I've not got Ethernet in there, but it will be in a, a release soon. And um, Again, if you're using, uh, as I discussed a little bit earlier, the Jazz API, if you're generating the messages for the API in some other programming language like LabVIEW, then you can control the thing directly. So the, the demo that I showed earlier where I was controlling the game, that was actually a LabVIEW application talking to the Jazz using the messaging protocol directly. Uh, so it was, it was talking right to it. So that is just another way to do it. Uh, it's also possible to use the, the push button interface on the front of the Jazz that allows you to set the outputs, including the 420 transmit, the GPIOs, and the uh, four analog voltage out. And you can also use that interface to calibrate uh, all the things that can be calibrated. Uh, Spectra Suite does also provide an interface, which I'll show here. So I was going to do a little demonstration here. Uh, this is a pair of applications that are kind of complementary. 
These could actually be running on entirely different computers. They don't know about each other explicitly. So the fact that they're running together and you know, seem to be linked, they're actually going to be linked by virtue of a loopback connector that I'm going to plug into the back of the Indy. This connector takes the four voltage outputs and wires them to the four voltage inputs. It takes half of the GPIOs and wires them to the other half of the GPIOs. And it also connects the, uh, the 4 to 20 uh, current loop back onto itself. So you can kind of use that to, to verify that all the different functions are working. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, start this application uh, communicating with the Jazz over the network. And then I'm going to start this application to do the same. Um, the one on the left is going to control the voltage output from the uh, Indy, and the other is going to control the voltage input. So as you can see, as I grab these controls and drag them around on the left, you can see that on the right, they respond immediately. Just one. Uh, so the, the panel on the left is uh, controlling the outputs from the, the four voltage outs on the ND. And the panel on the right is simply receiving, it's um, independently of that, it's requesting what the, the current sensed voltages are on those channels. And it's rendering it on these lab view controls. So, and just to, to kind of prove this, if I go over here and disconnect the connector, the loopback, they all snap back to zero. So it really is measuring. You can see that it's very peppy. It's very responsive. So, and this is running in, in real time over the network. So, just to give you a little bit of an idea that if somebody were trying to do an industrial application on this, this is something we pulled off in LabVIEW, it wasn't terribly difficult, and these are the kind of, you know, interfaces that we start building up with their own application, whatever it was. Let me go ahead and stop these. And what I'd like to do next is to fire up SpectraSuite. Uh, this is going to be communicating with the ND over USB. Um, USB communications are a little bit slower, well, perceptibly slower than the uh, Ethernet. And that's just due to the way the, the Jazz DPU is architected. It's not what we can do about it. Oops, it's not that other you're running. So if I go into Spectra Suite, close off this graph because I don't really need it go into the spectrometer features, this Indy tab. What I have in here is all of my voltage inputs are going to be over here. This is what I'm sampling. I can control the voltage out here using just sending counts anywhere from 0 to 65,000, 65,535, or minus 5 to 5 directly in here. Uh, I have my 4 to 20 loop, which um, I've got my excitation here. I can set the voltage. I then have the uh, 4 to 20 transmitter and uh, the receiver up here. So this little indicator over here is, it's a passive receiver. Um, what I'd like to do is command this to a couple of different points. What this will do is go from a display of zero when I'm at four milliamps up to a display of 100 when I'm at uh, 20 milliamps. So what I'm able to do is just control this thing directly. And you can see on this meter, if you're able to see that, I've set this to 20 milliamps. And on the meter, I can read 19.998. Pretty good. So there's another way that I can control this, which is through the, the jazz display here. So I'm, I'm in the, the indie menu. What I want to do is configure my outputs so I'm doing uh, 4 to 20 milliamp transmit control. I want to set the value. And what this will allow me to do is to set the value in a percentage. This little indicator over here has also been calibrated to show a percentage. So somebody call out a percentage, 0 to 100. You can even go to the tenths place if you want to. And I will make it appear on that display. I will type it in here, and it will show up there. 14.4. Huh? 14.4. How's that? <laughs> and what's the meter say? Uh, as far as, well, actually, I guess we don't know what 14.4 maps to in terms of 0 to 20. But. So the, the 4 to 20 is actually very accurate. 
Now I can control it easily, and you can see that I've, I got a, an external third-party device to agree perfectly with what I told it to do. So what I'd also like to show is um, the voltage output, which just requires that I rearrange some uh, clips here. And what I want to do is set my voltage out. This has been calibrated also. Um, it, it might be a little different temperature in here, but I'm going to put this at 2.5 volts exactly. And what does the meter say? 2.5038. So I'm within about what, 4 millivolts. And I could probably calibrate this and get it down even further. We can get it down into the, the microvolts. The other thing I can show is um, using this interface in spectrum suite as well. If I switch back to my loopback connector, uh, which shorts some of the um, GPIO outputs into the inputs, tell this to update, you can see that I've assigned four of these pins as outputs, and then I've set two of them to be logic high. And these map over, so that these are now sensed as being logic high. So this wires come straight over. So that's basically the indie. So if you can either generate the voltage or you can measure the voltage with a trusted external device, then you can calibrate the jazz to it using its push-button interface directly.